Hi, and welcome to Introduction to Mesoamerican and Andean Art. My name is Adelie Halpin. I'll be your instructor for this course this semester. Um, and I wanted to start out this introduction lecture by talking a little bit about what to expect for this class, um, what art history is um, as a discipline, as a study, what that looks like for studying Mesoamerican and Andean art. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the introduction to art of Mesoamerica because that's the uh, region that we'll be studying in the first half of the semester. We'll be studying Andean in the second half of the semester. Um, and I wanted to just go over what to expect for this class and introduce you to some of the major themes and topics that we will be discussing um, during this course. So uh, this is an art history class. So although you will have an opportunity um, to create some sort of uh, visual aid for your research project, for the most part, this is an art history class um, where we will be taking an app, a scholarly and academic approach, an object-based approach um, to learning more about um, these cultures, their technologies, their beliefs, their cosmologies, um, and as that's reflected and as that's communicated through um, their art and their architecture. So our learning objectives for today, um, for the first part of the lecture, are to explain the cultural foundations of the diverse ways art has been defined and characterized, um, distinguish four different ways that art historians investigate works of art, and identify the components of the four-part method of art historical investigation that leads to the historical interpretation of a work of art. Um, and for those of you who would like to take notes, I highly suggest that you take notes during lectures. Um, I will also be posting, uh, each week I will be posting the lecture slides for you to take notes um, and study from as well. So uh, in order to talk about art history, I think it's important that we define um, a few terms before we get started this semester. Um, so uh, you may have different definitions of art um, in your own mind that might be slightly different from some of these definitions that we have on the board right now. Um, but I personally, as far as when it comes to defining art, I kind of resonate with this first point, which is something human made that combines creative imagination and technical skill. I think that's a pretty broad and inclusive um, interpretation of art that can cover uh, performance art, fashion, um, architecture, design, illustrations, all sorts of different things can be encompassed in as something that human made that combines creative imagination and technical skill. Um, Stockstad and Cawthron um, in their uh, textbook, Art History, also define art as quality, production, expression, or realm of what is beautiful. So oftentimes art can reflect um, ideals of a certain culture or time period. Um, art can also be conceptual meaning of work for an elite target audience. Uh, we will definitely see artworks um, in Mesoamerican and Andean cultures that are specifically meant for an elite art audience um, who would know uh, what their artwork was about and what was it was representing. Um, and art can also be a, an attempt to pose challenging questions or unsettled deep-seated cultural ideas. Um, so those are a few definitions of art that we'll be working with. It's important to note, especially when we're studying ancient art or art from cultures that are uh, somewhat removed from our own, um, is that not all works of art um, have to be created by individuals who call themselves artists. Um, I know in our modern world, we think of professional artists, um, you know, saying like, I'm an artist, this is what I'm creating. Uh, obviously that's not been the case for every single culture um, across time and history. Um, and similarly, not all works of art are produced for exhibition and dispersion into the art market. So a lot of the places where you'll probably see Mesoamerican and Andean art might be in a textbook or in a museum display. Um, and it's important for us to remember that pretty much all of the works of art that we're seeing uh, or that we'll be looking at and investigating for this class um, are not works of art that were just designed to hang on a wall and look pretty. Um, many of the objects that we'll be looking at have 
um, both aesthetic and utilitarian um, purposes. So for example, this image right here is a uh, costume and jewelry mask from Teotihuacan um, in central Mexico. Um, this was created to be an incense burner um, and scholars um, believe that these masks or faces may be representations of ancestors. So while you might see it as a work of art today, if you went and saw it in a museum, um, for the people who created it, they were probably commissioned to create it for a family so they could burn incense as part of their um, spiritual and religious practice at home. So that is something to keep in mind. All right, so now that we've established um, a little bit of an inclusive definition or, or a few definitions of what art is, let's talk a little bit about what art history is. We'll also go over some of the uh, scholarly methods that art historians imply in, or apply in their um, art historical research and endeavors. So art historians seek to understand the meaning of art both from the point of view of its producers and its consumers at the time it was created. So what are the goals of the people creating the work of art or architecture? And what are the goals of the people who are buying it or commissioning it from them? Um, uh, today, people might talk about how art is political. Um, I want you to know that a lot of the art that we'll be looking at in this class is also political. Um, we see uh, works of art created, um, you know, to be impressive or to tell about the power of a ruler or a religious cult. Um, there are many, many different uh, goals that art, artists and producers have um, in creating um, their artworks. This is a ceremonial cup um, from the Moche culture um, down by the Andes. Um, so the the discipline of art history is a scholarly rather than intuitive exercise. Um, this process typically requires extensive research, analysis, and investigation to place a work of art in its original context, specifically if the work of art is from a culture or time far removed from the art historian. So we would want to learn as much as we can about the culture, um, the people uh, who are commissioning the work of art, how it's being used, who's seeing it, um, all of those are questions that art historians seek to answer through their research. So what are some types of investigation that art historians employ? Um, so they include assessment of physical properties. Um, so establishing what a work of art is made out of. This is a really beautiful scrap of Paracas textile. Um, this is um, made from camelid fiber, so animals that are related to llamas. Um, were used for their wool. So this is camelid fiber, uh, a plain weave with stem stitch embroidery. So this is woven and embroidered. Um, this is one way that we could assess the physical properties of this particular work of art. Um, you would also want to do an analysis of its visual or formal structure. Um, so this is a scrap of textile. This isn't the full textile, um, but we could uh, talk about the formal structure where we have these um, human figures that are more or less um, bilaterally symmetrical. They're rotated um, on a blank background or a solid colored background. Then we would want to do an identification of subject matter or conventional symbolism. So just by looking at these, we can see that these are humans. Um, but if we look really closely, we notice that these humans have um, feet that look more like bird talons. Um, we can see that they're wearing these uh, really impressive masks and headdresses. Um, we see that they're wearing wings, so they're giving themselves attributes of a bird. Um, and if we look closely, we can see that there's little heads um, that seem to be hanging from these um, wings or this winged outfit. So. Um, this is a few ways that we could identify the subject matter or some of this symbolism. We also see that they're holding on to um, snakes as well. Um, then we would want to integrate them within a cultural context. Um, so, for example, for this uh, work of art, um, we could put this into the context of shamanism. Um, the fact that the Paracas culture uh, did practice shamanism 
um, and that these may uh, very well represent shamans um, going on a spiritual journey uh, where they are taking on aspects of uh, birds in their journey um, and maybe harnessing the power of snakes as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about these four different types of investigation that you will want to know. The assessment of physical properties, analysis of visual or formal structure, identification of subject matter or conventional symbolism, and integration within a cultural context. So when we assess physical properties of a work of art, um, this includes things like size, shape, materials, and the technique used to create the work of art. So in books um, that you'll be reading for this course, in books these elements can only be described in captions, but being in the presence of the work will make the work's size and shape very evident. Um, so to understand the medium, it may be necessary to research contemporary, contemporaneous artistic practices. Um, this is a photo from, of my friend uh, when we visited the uh, Teotihuacan City of Water, City of Fire exhibition um, at the De Young Museum in San Francisco. So a lot of these works of art that I had been reading and researching about, I only knew from the pages of uh, museum catalogs, uh, textbooks, screens, research screens on my computer. Um, and it was really impressive to see how uh, large a lot of these works of art were um, that I didn't quite have an appreciation for um, prior to that. So um, I do offer a uh, extra credit opportunity for you uh, that you can do at any point throughout the semester, um, because I do think it's really important that we get out and experience art um, in real life, in real time. Um, so look more on that on Canvas. Um, but if you go visit a museum or go visit some art or architecture in person, you can do a little write up about it and get some extra credit. So I highly, highly, highly recommend that you do that. Um, analyzing formal structure is a second investigation. Um, so formal analysis allows art historians to explore the materials and techniques brought to each work. Uh, the first part of analysis involves visual elements or formal vocabulary involved in pictorial or sculptural communication. The second part involves discovering the overall organization structure of an image known as composition. So I have a whole um, slide deck um, and recording on the formal analysis paper where you can learn a little bit more about uh, what formal analysis is in art history and you'll get a chance to practice that um, in one of the assignments this semester. So for example, um, when we look at composition, the overall arrangement or design is considered. So this is um, a gold and turquoise earpiece that was excavated at Sipan. Um, this is a, we could say this is a circular composition. It's more or less um, bilaterally symmetrical. We have the two warriors on either side um, facing inward. And uh, we consider both the flat two-dimensional aspects of this and the three-dimensional aspects where we have um, necklaces and body parts kind of sticking out um, of this composition. All right. Um, Third up, we have identification of subject matter or conventional symbolism. So Erwin Panofsky proposed the system of analysis that combined perception of natural subject matter with identification of iconography. Um, and it's important, so this basically means natural um, subject matter is, you know, when we look at these warriors from Sapan, and we might not necessarily know the identification identity of these characters, but they more or less look like people wearing um, armor and uh, regalia. So that's an example. We might not know who those people are, if it's supposed to represent a deity or a, a, a ruler or perhaps a military leader. Um, we might not know those things yet unless we knew more about that culture. Um, but just by looking at them, they do look like humans. Um, and we could learn a little bit more um, about this culture and find out what these different um, headdresses mean, um, what these different um, necklaces that they're wearing might tell us about them. Um, and that would uh, 
that would lead us into our next step, which is um, integration within cultural context. So some works of art contain subjects from outside conventional symbolism. Um, we'll definitely get into that with uh, art from the Andes. We have a lot of really interesting symbolism and abstraction that's going to be really exciting to look at. Um, but uh, that being said, Panofsky's method remains a standard for art historians regardless. Um, so, for example, um, this uh, Raimondi stila is a very famous um, work of art and it shows um, some sort of god or deity holding staffs. Um, and this might be really overwhelming for us to look at, um, but we can look for different aspects that we can uh, recognize easily. Um, so beneath the god's hands, uh, we see upside down and sideways faces. Um, the staffs terminate um, up in snake heads with tongues coming out of them. Um, we have what look like snakes instead of hair on this uh, figure. Um, and then the god's hands and feet have talons um, rather than human fingernails, which kind of remind us of felines or birds of prey. Um, so a lot of, like, especially the slightly more abstracted art that we'll see in Andean um, shows us a lot of, like, recognizable symbolism and also some symbols that we're going to have to learn a little bit more about the cultural context to properly identify. So the third step in Panofsky's pr proposition is interpreting iconology, which involves placing the work in its social, political, religious, and intellectual contexts. So, for example, this uh, goblet from San Jose uh, de Moro, um, from the Mo Moche culture, um, the cultural context we might learn a little bit more about by studying other works of art from the Moche culture. Um, this stirrup spout vessel shows this um, ritual taking place where we have uh, priests and priestesses uh, in these really fabulously over-the-top outfits, and they are presenting the blood of a sacrifice victim, which we see that story unfolding at the bottom. Um, we see that they are sacrificing a victim and that they were filling the cup with human blood and presenting it to the priestess. Now, um, this stirrup spout vessel um, illustration had led a lot of art historians to believe that um, this ritual might not be, it might be a legend, it might be a story, it probably wasn't something that actually happened in real life. Um, but um, the discovery of a moche priestess with all the regalia of this priestess in this illustration um, showed us that her tomb actually had these goblets in them and that the goblets actually did in fact have residues of uh, compounds from human blood in them. Um, so the integration within a cultural context um, can tell us a little bit more about how this goblet functioned um, in real life. And again, we'll get to that story um, when we study uh, Moche culture in uh, the Andes. Um, that being said, that is a very, very brief overview of the discipline of art history. Um, so we will be looking at the art and architecture of Mesoamerica and the Andes through the art historical lens. Um, so just remember those four things, um, those four lenses in which um, are those four questions that kind of drive art historical scholarly research. Um, that being said, let's jump into introduction to Mesoamerican art. All right, so as a reminder, um, make sure that you have a copy of our first textbook for this class, which is The Art of Mesoamerica by Mary Ellen Miller. Um, so make sure that you're following along with your readings uh, throughout this course. Um, the second half of the semester, we will be looking at art of the Andes. All right, so let's start out by talking a little bit about chronology in the Americas. Um, so new discoveries really keep pushing back the dates of human arrival and migration to the Americas. Um, for most of the 20th century, scholars, art historians, archaeologists uh, believed that um, people hadn't really been inhabiting the Americas until about uh, 10,000 years ago. 
um, that has that date has been pushed back um, with more and more recent discoveries um, in the 21st century primarily. So this upper image uh, illustrates human migration through the Bering Land Bridge, um, but new discoveries suggest that this might not be the only route that um, people um, moved into the Americas um, in very, very deep prehistory. Um, so anthropologists believe that um, humans as a species originated uh, out of Africa and then slowly started to migrate and populate the rest of the continents. The Bering Land Bridge um, used to connect Alaska to um, what is now uh, Russia. Um, but it's important to remember that the Earth is a globe and that during the last ice age, there were also a lot of really big ice sheets connecting um, the polar regions of Eurasia um, with the polar regions of North America. This lower illustration also shows uh, proposed trade routes, um, seafaring trade routes between um, folks in the Americas and uh, people from Polynesia. This has been demonstrated by uh, DNA analysis of sweet potatoes in the uh, islands of the Pacific. And sweet potatoes are a American uh, New World type of food. And, and so there are many, many different uh, discoveries and scientific kind of breakthroughs that keep showing us that people have been living in and populating the Americas for a very, very, very long time. I wouldn't be surprised if, if um, more discoveries even push back our broader understandings of um, the arrival to the Americas even further back in history. Um, Mary Ellen Miller mentions, you know, kind of between that 12,000 and 20,000 years ago region as being um, more or less when people uh, started to populate the Americas. Uh, but the, this isn't anything that you'll be quizzed on. This is just um, setting the scene for this art history class. Um, I did want to mention that one of the um, kind of breakthroughs in technology that's really, really been um, helping the study of the art and architecture of ancient Mesoamerica specifically is LIDAR. So LIDAR is light detection and ranging. And, and it's a remote sensing technology. It uses a laser to measure, measure distances to the earth and it can help create 3D models of the real world. Um, so LIDAR can work from an airplane flying over a really thick jungle um, and it can send out millions of laser pulses per second. It reflects off objects and returns back to the scanner. Um, and so it can actually cut through and make images of um, ruins of civilizations, of um, architecture, even, even if it's been covered over um, by, you know, hundreds or thousands of years of rainforest growth. Um, so this has been very, very exciting. Um, in 2021, new structures were discovered at Tikal using LIDAR. Um, and it's just really revolutionizing Mesoamerican archaeology, especially in these jungle areas. Um, so this uh, study of ancient Mesoamerica is definitely a dynamic experience, um, and I'll be doing my best to post links to um, relevant new discoveries um, that might be even newer than um, your textbook is. So uh, let's start out by defining Mesoamerica before we get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, so Mesoamerica can be more or less described as um, literally meaning Middle America. Um, so uh, when we talk about Mesoamerica in the context of this class, um, it's more or less Mexico, but also Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Um, this is an area where we had um, really a great cultures um, and empires uh, rise up, and they are not necessarily connected in a super permanent way with the cultures of um, farther North North America and farther South South America, uh, but there definitely are a lot of connections with trade that we'll talk about soon. So 
Uh, Mesoamerica is a cultural region united by the use of a ritual 260-day calendar. Um, you might be wondering why a 260-day calendar? Um, 260 days is the time period of human gestation. Um, and the 260-day calendar um, also would kind of interlock with and rotate with a 360-day calendar in the Maya culture. Um, Mesoamerica is a locus of New World high civilizations from about 1500 BCE until the invasion of the Spanish around 3000 years later in 1519 CE. Um, and it's a region that had contact again and trade with both North and South American cultures, um, which we see um, in the evidence of turquoise from the American Southwest and um, uh, other technologies like gold working that they learned from South America. So geographically speaking, Mesoamerica is located in the southern part of North America. And um, in this map, uh, we can see that most of Mesoamerica has a tropical climate and high temperatures. Uh, it has a lot of, many of these areas have a lot of humidity throughout the year. Um, we have a, a rainy season that typically runs from May to October. Um, and during that time, heavy rains can cause flooding in many different areas, especially around lakes and river valleys. Um, the dry season, which lasts from November to April, begins uh, brings drier weather conditions that can lead to droughts. So this map shows um, the higher altitude regions as darker green and the lower elevations as this kind of lighter um, tan and sort of yellow color. So here's a reminder of the tropical uh, tropical climates, a lot of the rain that comes from these tropical climates, um, but that also can contrast with um, drier regions in the central plateaus um, between the Sierra Madre Occidental and the Sierra um, Madre Oriental. Um, so a lot of this really uh, abundant rain and warm climate uh, fairly close to the equator um, has led to Mesoamerica being the uh, a really um, uh, re really successful area for um, agriculture. So the tropical climate and abundant rainfall leads to fertile soil. Civilizations developed advanced agricultural practices, allowing them to sustain very large populations. Um, however, during the periodic droughts, sometimes um, this would cause uh, crop devastation and famine. Okay. So um, on this slide, I have some examples of uh, agriculture that was cultivated in the New World. So uh, things like gourds, squashes, pumpkins, um, those are New World foods, uh, tomatoes, avocados, um, corn or maize, um, also beans. So a lot of the you know, tomatoes, we always think of like Italian food having a lot of tomatoes, um, but we have to remember that uh, the Italians didn't have tomatoes until the tomatoes were brought over from the New World. The Sierra Madre is a mountain range that stretches north to south in modern day Mexico. In the center, we have the central uh, plateau or also known as the Mexican plateau. Um, and this valley is where the Aztec civilization um, developed. Um, in this central plateau, they developed a special farming method known as um, chinampas, which means floating gardens. Uh, they created man-made floating islands that allowed them to grow crops on the shallow lake bed. Um, and the mountains and valleys created natural barriers that separated the different regions of Mesoamerica. Um, this also influenced the movement of people and goods between them. Um, this led to the development of distinct different cultures throughout Mesoamerica um, and different traditions in each region. Um, for example, we have the Maya that developed on the Yucatan Peninsula um, versus the Aztecs, which lived in the highlands of central Mexico. Um, so the south, um, to the south of Mesoamerica is the Central American um, dense rainforest. Um, we have the Pacific Ocean to the west, the Gulf of Mexico to the east, um, and Historians think that the rainforest actually kept Mayan city-states somewhat isolated. Um, they never truly unified into um, an empire because of the thick jungle. 
Um, and these jungles also featured freshwater sinkholes known as cenotes, which provided civilizations there with drinking water. Um, so there's many different ways that the, the landscape of Mesoamerica um, informs and shapes the different cultures and religions and cosmologies that um, develop out of them. So uh, to break it down into two kind of easy things to remember, uh, we have the highlands and the lowlands in Mesoamerica. So we have high cool valleys um, and lowland kind of humid jungle areas. So in the highland areas, um, the large valleys attracted very large populations. Um, and in volcanic areas, we find obsidian, which was incredibly important to Mesoamericans for creating knife blades. In the lowland humid jungles, um, we have uh, the domestication of cotton um, and folks being able to harvest um, things like cacao and vanilla from the jungles. And uh, so these different regions really drive trade um, and help define the cultures and their art. Um, so, uh, for example, we have some evidence of trade with um, cultures from North America um, in Central America. <clears throat> so this is Chaco Canyon. It's located in modern day New Mexico. Um, and these are some cylindrical vessels that were um, discovered and created at this site. They are thought to be created in the 11th century CE. And uh, recently, researchers actually decided to check the inside of these vessels to check for any chemical traces to see um, what exactly these vessels were used for, what, what kind of materials they were filled with. Um, so the tests actually revealed the presence of uh, theobromine, which is uh, a biomarker for cacao. This confirmed that um, this is this confirmed the earliest use of chocolate north of the Mexican border. So cacao um, does not grow in North America. And so these folks at Chaco Canyon um, were clearly trading with um, people from uh, the Mayan regions of Mesoamerica. So this is the ancestral Pueblo lands. And we can compare and contrast this with a cylindrical vessel for cacao. Um, from the Maya culture in Guatemala um, from about 700 to 800 CE. So art historians had noticed the um, formal similarities in these vessels. They're both cylindrical, they're both tall, narrow with um, geometric designs on the, si on the sides, uh, which could show a potential connection to the Maya culture. Um, but this is a traditional vessel for drinking cacao. Um, and we found out that Chaco Canyon, uh, those folks were making fossils to drink cacao with as well. Um, gold working and metallurgy was developed in the Andes around 3000 BCE, which is a lot longer, or it's a lot earlier than what we see in Mesoamerica. Um, in Mesoamerica, we see a lot of gold work and metallurgy by around 800 CE, so um, actually much later. Um, so we can compare Moche gold work from about 300 to uh, 600 CE with Maya gold work from around 900 CE. Um, these flat pieces of hammered gold um, would have probably originally been added onto a Maya mask, um, but it is really impressive to see the craftsmanship here in this hammered gold piece from the Maya civilization. So there are connections to the Caribbean, of course, um, Bernal Diaz de Castillo uh, was a principal chronicle, chronicler for the Spanish invasion. He noticed that a cook they brought from Jamaica also spoke Mayan. And Ferdinand, Ferdinand Columbus documented capturing a, a large seafaring canoe that was traveling with fine, uh, fine goods and people off the coast of Honduras. Um, so there are a lot of uh, connections between the Caribbean cultures and the cultures of Mesoamerica. They are geographically pretty close um, and they definitely did interact with each other. Um, next, we'll talk a little bit about um, the uh, overlap and uh, timelines of the Mesoamerican cultures. So uh, the term classic has been applied to Mesoamerican art and archaeology because uh, people studying the art of 
Mesoamerica noticed that the um, Maya civilization had this um, fully functioning calendars, they had fully functioning um, language and written, uh, or sorry, of course they had fully functioning language, but they had um, written language that could be um, uh, decoded, decoded and uh, read. Um, and so this time period that coincides with kind of the height of the Maya empire has been uh, labeled as the classic. Um, and so we call um, the era before that the pre-classic or the formative um, and the era after that uh, between kind of the height of the Ma Maya empire and the Spanish invasion as this uh, post-classic era. And um, when we're talking about Mesoamerican technology, um, it can be easy to compare Mesoamerican technology with old world technology and wonder, you know, just because they did things differently um, doesn't mean that they didn't have uh, really useful um, and practical technologies for the challenges that they faced. So wheels were, we see wheels in toys in Mesoamerica, um, but we never really see axles develop. Um, and one of the reasons why Mesoamericans probably never um, did a whole lot with developing the wheel is because they did not uh, domesticate any type of draft animals. So usually pulling a cart is useful if you have something big and strong to pull it. Um, you also need to have graded roads in order for wheels to even be useful. Um, so, you know, different priorities, different technologies. Uh, we do see draft animals being used in the Andes mountain range, uh, but we don't really see draft animals being used or domesticated in uh, ancient Mesoamerica. Uh, although Mesoamerica did get technology for creating metalwork from the Andes region, um, we mostly see folks using metalwork for creating ceremonial and um, decorative items, luxury goods, um, and not weapons. Um, obsidian was actually preferred over metal for creating weapons like knives and spearheads and arrowheads. Um, and in case you were doubting, many surgeons today are actually switching back to using obsidian um, because it is much sharper and more effective um, as a blade compared to um, metal. Uh, when the Spanish arrived uh, to the Americas, they were very obsessed with getting gold. However, um, the way that we value things, uh, the way we value different types of art or materials uh, is oftentimes very, very culturally informed. Um, so perhaps those of us coming from a Western culture, um, you know, we've been taught to value gold. We've been taught that gold is expensive, it holds its value, um, it's very precious. Um, and so coming in with that mindset, many people assume that all cultures would value gold more highly than other materials, but that's just not true. Uh, we do see the use of gold in luxury goods in Mesoamerica and also the Andes. Um, but it's important to remember that most of these Mesoamerican cultures actually valued jade and greenstone much more highly than gold. Um, so having a mask or a work of art created out of jade um, was more highly valued uh, than gold, although we do see gold used as well. Um, and I include greenstone in here because technically um, not all of the work, not all of the stone that they're using is, you know, technically jade, uh, but if it was that nice kind of greenish color and easily worked, um, they kind of all considered it the same uh, as jade. Um, also, woven cloth um, made from cotton in Mesoamerica and uh, in the Andes we see a lot of uh, wool from llamas. Uh, woven cloth in Mesoamerica was actually developed before ceramics um, and fine woven cloth really held its value and could be used as currency in um, many of these cultures. I know we don't always think of cloth as being like money, but um, in many of these cultures, they would actually pay tribute in uh, cloth. This is an example of a uh, jade 
figure from the Olmec culture. Um, this is a standing figure holding a supernatural effigy. So this is an example of some of the fine, fine craftsmanship that we see in Mesoamerica um, when it comes to jade objects. Um, and it's important to note that Mesoamerican agriculture, uh, it really does speak to their technology and their ability to um, you know, create these large population centers. Oftentimes we associate um, highly uh, organized social groups, empires, civilizations with the advent of agriculture, although that's not necessarily always true. Uh, but we definitely see that in Mesoamerica. So before, even before the emergence of civilization or, you know, people living in urban centers, that's all I mean by civilization. Um, before the emergence of civilization, uh, people had domesticated um, cassava, which is what uh, ta tapioca is made out of. Um, they had beans, squash, tomatoes, avocados, sunflowers, sweet potatoes, chili peppers, um, and they also learned to harvest cacao and the uh, vanilla beans from um, plants in the jungle. And um, this is an example of a young maize god from the Maya. Um, many of these different Mesoamerican cultures had some sort of corn or maize deity. That's how important um, corn and agriculture was to these um, cultures. Um, so, uh, like I mentioned with that little timeline um, in the chronology of Mesoamerica, um, the time period associated with Maya height is between around 300 to 900 CE in our calendar, um, and this is referred to as classic. By the way, just a note about the um, time dates um, in our calendar. This, everybody might know this, but I'm just throwing it out there in our calendar. Um, a, uh, the word CE is the same as um, AD. Um, CE just means common era or current era. Um, AD means um, in the year of our Lord in Latin. So in some older publications, this would be 300 to 900 AD. Um, AD and CE are the same thing. Um, when we're looking at uh, older history, so before the birth of Christ, before year zero on our calendar, it will either say BC or BCE. BC just means before Christ. BCE means before uh, the common era. Um, so that's how our calendar works. So don't be confused by the CE and AD um, crossover. Um, in recent years, academics have decided to shift away from um, using BC and, BC and AD um, with something a little bit more inclusive. Um, obviously in the Western culture, um, many of the people responsible for um, keeping records, um, keeping track of histories have been our um, religious leaders. Um, and so that's obviously reflected in our calendar being centered around the birth of Christ. Um, but CE is just what uh, we use more commonly now. I think in some of the readings, some of the readings you look up might still say BC and AD. Um, but let's move along. Um, so formative uh, classic and post-classic periods are uh, chronological markers and not descriptive terms. So uh, formative is also known as pre-classic. Um, this is the era from about uh, 2000 BCE um, until around uh, 250 or 300 AD. Uh, again, these are very kind of loose terms and are not necessarily um, coinciding with like hard lines of like this year, this ends. Um, so they are chronological markers, not descriptive terms. So um, just because something happened in the classic era doesn't mean that we value it any higher than anything that came before or after it. I know calling something classic or pre-classic might assume that there's some sort of like height evolution or arc where classic is like the best art ever. Um, but that of course shows um, personal judgments from the um, art historian or, or whoever's writing about that work of art. Um, Post-classic is this period that we um, does loosely defined as 
900 to 1500 CE, and then um, the European contact of the Spanish invasion happened in 1519. Um, so that's like uh, post-colonial, colonial periods. So chronological markers, not descriptive terms. Um, it is important to um, recognize that um, most of these Mesoamerican cultures did have uh, functioning uh, calendars for, um, you know, tracking ritual holidays for tracking um, planting season, harvesting season, all of that um, good stuff. So by around 100 BCE, the Maya and perhaps others had fully functioning calendar systems of interlocking cycles. Um, so for the Maya, instead of dividing their calendar into months, um, it's made from a succession of 20 day glyphs um, in combinations with the numbers one through 13. It produces 260 unique days. Remember, 260 days is the um, time of human gestation. So perhaps some of these earliest calendars were established by midwives and perhaps not by astro uh, astronomers. Um, so 20 by times 13 is 260 days. Um, and this image illustrates how the numbers 1 through 13 um, cycle through the 20 glyphs from the dates um, in the calendar. And then um, there are also, they also had a 360 day calendar, which is like more or less the solar calendar, which is very close to the calendar that we use. Uh, we'll talk more about the calendars um, in another lecture. So you don't have to know all this information just yet, but I did want you to know that um, the, these people were uh, very good at uh, recording dates and um, having these uh, calendrical systems. Um, and uh, interestingly enough to us, like we as a culture, perhaps growing up, have gone back to historical sites as parts of field trips or maybe just when we travel and want to learn more about um, a different area uh, or culture. Um, but the Aztec culture um, was actually known to go back and visit the already ancient site of Teotihuacan and others for ceremonies. Um, they also had a habit of bringing back art and artifacts from these ancient sites uh, around Mesoamerica and then burying them in caches, um, you know, with no regard for their original uh, provenance or location. Um, and so this has caused a little bit of trouble for um, archaeologists and art historians because we have all of this like displaced um, artwork that's not from its original context. So um, that shows us that our culture is not unique in you know valuing and wanting to learn from the art of the past. Um, so there's systemic recovery and study of ancient Mesoamerica um, in a more academic um, aspect began around 300 years after the Spanish invasion. So it started around the late 18th century. Um, this, uh, some of the paintings and drawings and illustrations by Frederick Catherwood um, actually helped kind of spark interest in learning more about these um, Mayan and other uh, Mesoamerican ruins. Um, this is a uh, work of art from 1844. Um, where Catherwood is actually very meticulously and very accurately um, recreated a lot of these um, works of architecture. Um, and so we can see them, how they looked uh, pretty, pretty faithfully in the 1800s. Um, he also oftentimes includes illustrations of the local people. So here are some Maya people um, that he has illustrated here um, as well. Uh, it is important to note that um, the general history of the Things New Spain um, by Bernardino de um, Sahagun is actually one of the um, most important and most valuable resources that we have um, about understanding the um, Maya people um, and the Aztec people close to the time of European contact. Um, he created this book um, along with a team of indigenous authors. Um, it's very highly illustrated um, and he recorded information about uh, culture, cosmology, language, um, what different headdresses and 
um, clothing meant to these indigenous people. Um, and Bernardino was a Franciscan friar. So you will want to know that general history of the new of the things of New Spain um, is a very important resource for understanding these cultures. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the um, things that we'll be studying during this class. So we will be studying works of architecture. Um, we will be studying some of the different cultures that developed these different styles of architecture. Um, we'll talk about some of the different um, purposes and beliefs um, in forming um, these massive works of construction. So we have to call on the left, um, Machu Picchu on the right. Um, we'll also be looking at um, works of wearable art. So we'll be looking at some of the incredible textile arts specifically from the Andes. Um, we'll look at um, other pieces of regalia like this Aztec feather headdress. Um, we'll look at some of the different ways that um, our clothing and what we put on our bodies, uh, what that communicates with others about um, who we are, what our role in society is, um, if we should be feared, if we should be respected. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things that we can learn about and unpack from studying um, textile arts and uh, regalia. Um, we'll also look at some of the different ways that these Mesoamerican and Andean cultures have traditionally kept records. Um, so although the Maya has uh, definitely probably like the fullest, most easy to understand and decipher um, script and writing system of any of these cultures that we will study this semester. Um, I do want you to know that pretty much all the cultures that we will be studying had some sort of uh, record keeping. So for example, in the Andes, um, different cultures, including the Inca, used a kipu, uh, which is a way of uh, tying knots and strings to keep records and tell histories. Um, we, of course, have the Maya codices and many other different Mesoamerican um, glyphs that can tell us more information about um, the identity of different people in illustrations, um, dates and purposes of different um, works of art. Um, so we'll be learning a lot about them this semester. And we'll also uh, discuss different ways in which um, the Spanish invasion, forced assimilation, um, and the introduction of um, Catholicism and other uh, Western ideals have kind of influenced and interacted with um, indigenous cultures and uh, empires. So I really look forward to this semester with everybody. Um, again, uh, reach out to me if you have any questions about any of this and I will post these slides for your reference.